Uh, so last time uh, we got to take a look at some of the genealogy uh, before the flood and the population size. Um, I have been asked if we were going to be needing calculators today and whether they would be regular or scientific. Uh, <laughs> I, I must apologize to Peter because um, I told him no, and now I looked at my notes. We, we might need a one, but it's not scientific, so we're good. Okay. Um, today we want to take a look at Noah, the ark, and the flood, um, and look at some of the details that will hopefully help to strengthen some of our faith, uh, you know, just a little bit from some of those details. Um, we'll look at the structure of the ark, its seaworthiness, um, how to fit potentially millions of animals on board and uh, a potential idea that might help manage the animals. And most importantly, how all of this demonstrates God's love for man. Let's go ahead and start with prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for your Sabbath, Lord. And uh, thank you so much for your word and uh, for these stories of faith from men of old. And uh, how you led them and worked in their lives, and I pray that you will uh, help us to learn from those and to strengthen our faith, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Well, that was cool. Oh, I don't know if I hit the wrong button, or... We'll try it again a couple times. There we go. Okay. Um, so, hold on. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, looking at Noah's Ark, um, uh, the Bible is pretty simple and straightforward as far as what the dimensions are on it. Um, it is 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits tall. That's very simple, straightforward. Do you ask what's a cubit? Um, <laughs> So a cubit, from my understanding, is like the measure of the forearm, a person's forearm. Uh, the challenge comes that there are different cubits. So there, there's, I want to say, like three or four different definitions of the length of a cubit. Um, the one I came across was the Nippur cubit. So that's the one I went with. Um, going off of that, the arc would have been 510 feet long. 85 feet wide and 51 feet tall. Um, if you want a little more uh, tangible illustration of that, I set up some cones in the parking lot. Uh, if you go to the north end uh, where the pavement stops, there's gonna be a cone out there. And on the south end of the church, almost where the sidewalk ends, there'll be another cone. That'll give you the 510 feet, <clears throat> excuse me. And then the middle gate over here, um, there's a cone next to it, and then another cone almost to the building. So that'll give you the width. So if you want to walk the dimensions of the ark, you can do that and take a look at it. Um, so Dr. Sion Wan Hong in 1993 did a scientific study of the design of the ark. Um, his study showed that the ark could have handled 100 foot tall waves and that the dimensions given for the ark were ideal for handling a turbulent sea. Um, so a little bit of information there. There we go. Okay, so taking that and comparing it to what we know about some of the waves, uh, the tallest wave ever surfed was 101 feet tall, um, but the largest open ocean wave was only 62.3 feet tall, and that was recorded on February 17, 2013. Um, so according to that, the ark should have been able to handle that without any problems. <clears throat> so, as far as the animals, how could that have worked with the ark? Um, scientists have estimated that there are around 8.7 million species of plants and animals in existence. 
However, only 1.2 million species have been identified and described so far. Uh, most of those are insects, so thankfully there should be small. Um, so there's millions of other organisms that uh, do remain a mystery that we're trying to figure out and identify them. Um, so what we're looking at here, if, we have a, if there's gonna be a lot of animals that we're putting onto the ark, how, how do we do that? So one idea would be instead of taking a 12,000 pound elephant, maybe take one that's 6,000, you know, half grown. <laughs> Don't necessarily need to take the full-grown variety there. Um, same thing, you know, with a rhino's lion. Instead of a 500-pound lion, let's take one that's maybe 150, 200 pounds. Um, now, something that I came up, I came across, and of course, can't completely uh, prove all this scientifically, but it's something to consider. It says the ability to hibernate is found throughout the class mammalia and appears to involve different expressions of genes common to all mammals rather than the inductive of novel gene products unique to the hibernation state. Um, so in other words, the idea is they're basically saying that most if not all mammals have a, the gene for hibernation in their genome, um, just not necessarily turned on. Um, so looking at your hibernation there, during hibernation, the animal lowers, it, lowers its body temperature, slows its breathing rate, heart rate, and metabolic rate. Uh, chipmunks reduce their heart rate from the usual 350 beats per minute to an almost undetectable four beats per minute during hibernation. Um, and during our children's story, we were talking about hummingbirds and I forgot the number, how fast their heart goes, but it's 1,000 beats per minute. And see, they, they also go into, I believe it's a state called torpor, where it kind of goes to sleep for a little bit and slows things down. Um, <clears throat> bears can also, now this I found interesting, bears can sleep for more than 100 days without eating, drinking, or passing waste. Um, the other thing they can do that um, some ladies might be jealous of, I think they can actually give birth while they're asleep. But <laughs> so, um, just saying. So, looking at the idea there, um, as far as hibernation, um, can't necessarily completely prove it all, you know, scientifically there, but. We're going to look at you know the animals coming to the ark um, and discuss that a little bit. So, could all of the animals have fit on board the ark? Hence, the idea of Tetris. Did did Noah have to try to figure out? Okay, if we turn this animal this way and stick him here, you know, did he have to do that, or was it something a little bit more manageable? Okay, so looking at that 8.7 million species, uh, but based on initial projections by the Ark Encounter team. Um, so if you've heard of some, I think a lot of people have heard of it, but if you haven't, there is the, it's called the Ark Encounter, I wanna say it's in Kentucky, and they built a, life size is not right, um, to scale replica of Noah's Ark. Um, and it's, very educational, multiple levels there. They have the, the animals and the cages, you know, and they, they try to teach a lot about it from what I saw online. If I'm ever in that area, I'm definitely stopping by because they, they have a ton of information. I thought it was really interesting. But according to the Ark Encounter team, they estimate that there would have been around 1,400 animal kinds on the Ark, uh, which would translate to about 7,000 animals. Okay. Oh, I should probably change the other one too. There we go. <clears throat> now, in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 67, uh, first paragraph, Ellen White mentions that 
for seven days these animals were coming into the ark and Noah was arranging them in places prepared for them. Now a lot of times we wind up seeing little videos or movies or whatever where it's like noon and animals start coming. Then by that evening, you know, the ramp is kind of all splintered up and there's droppings everywhere and um, it's all done. But Ellen White says that it didn't go that way, that for seven days those animals were coming. Is that probably because God couldn't figure out how to get it done in one day? I'm going to say probably not. Um, if, if God was doing that intentionally, why, why did he do that? You know, why would he have strung that out some? Because from what I understand, when, when the animals started coming into the ark, the people that were standing there making fun of Noah, mocking him, etc., it really kind of threw them back that they're like, wait, this, this isn't normal. What's going on here? Is he possibly correct in what he's saying? And God took that opportunity and stretched that window out for seven days. And it's kind of interesting that the animals were willing to listen to God's call and walked right past people that wouldn't listen to his call even when they were watching an active miracle right in front of them. Um, but seeing as how the animals came into the ark under God's guidance, um, that if he was able to control them to that extent, would it not also be possible that maybe he could work with that uh, hibernation gene and it's like, hey, you're feeling sleepy now. <laughs> <laughs> and you can go to sleep for the next. Because Noah, my understanding, Noah's on the ark for about a year. Um, so if maybe he dialed them in somewhere close to the bear and, you know, and they only woke up every 100 days to take care of things, then eight people taking care of 7,000 animals that only wake up every 100 days, maybe it seems more manageable. Okay, um, the other thing is that um, the animals that, that came into the ark, they did not come, it says that uh, they came, Noah took two of every kind or seven of every kind, not of every species. Um, so looking at kind, it is similar to either order or family in your taxonomy there. So your kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, they're kind of in the order or family. So looking at a couple examples of family, you have Felidae, which is your cats, um, comprised of 42 species, including the domestic cat. Canidae, dogs, wolves, coyotes, African wild dogs, etc., comprised of 35 different species. Uh, Ursidae, which is your bears, comprised of eight species. Mus Mustelidae, which is your weasels, badgers, otters, etc., comprised of 63 different species. I always love some of these words. Procyonidae, which is your raccoons, coatis, oligons, etc., and that's comprised of 14 different species. Now, we're looking at just five different examples of uh, your family groups there. So if you <coughs> add all that up with the regular calculator, not the scientific, you come up with 162 potential species that you'd be looking at. But for every species, you need at least two if they are unclean. So that would be, what is it, like 324, I think it is, something like that. Um, so if you took one of every species, you're looking at 324 animals. If you took two of every kind, you have five families times two, so you have 10 animals. So maybe you wouldn't have quite as many uh, the, quite the volume that you would have had if you were looking at each species. So um, the question then would be if you, if you only took two of every kind, so if Noah took only two of every kind, could that have diversified into what we see today? 
So looking at some of, your, some of the animals that we have today and looking at the genetic versatility or variety range, maybe, something along those lines um, that we have today. So looking at your cattle, top left hand, make sure I've got it right. That guy, his name is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, but he is, he's actually a Belgian blue and they are genetically bred to be double muscled. So that's the reason he looks like he lifts weights. He's huge. Um, but when it's for the meat industry, that kind of makes sense there. But that's the Belgian blue bottom left hand corner. Um, those are Zebus cows and the one on the ladies uh, left, that's full grown. They don't get very big. Um, then you have fluffy cows. I, that's what they call them. Um, I don't know why you want a fluffy cow, but somebody wants a fluffy cow, so they got a fluffy cow. Um, then you also have the Oreo cow. They, they like all turn out that way. They're, both ends are black and they're white in the middle. Um, it's actually called a belted Galloway cow, but I'm like, hey, that's, that's impressive. Then the one in the middle with the giant horns, that's an Inca Watusi, and Unlike longhorns, you know, they have really long horns, but they're like average size at the base. These things are like huge, they're, they're massive. Um, but my understanding, the large horns helps them to handle the heat in Africa better. Um, so you have quite a few different types of cattle there. Um, just looking at some of the extremes there, the biggest bull on record was a uh, Chianina bull named Bellino, who was measured at a height of six foot six inches at the shoulder and weighed approximately 3,500 pounds. Ooh, I probably should change the slide so you get to see him. There he is. He's huge, just a little huge, but he's a bit more than a Nissan Altima, and he comes with horns and hooves and attitude, and it's like, okay, that's huge. Um, let's see, now we get, we have to fit horses in there somewhere, so we've got horses. Um, top left is a Falab Falabella, which is a little horse. Um, then you have the Curly Bashkin, Bashker, sorry. He has like a permanent perm, I'm like, that's amazing. Then you have uh, top right, there you go, is, oh, lost it there, Przewalski's horse. And then the bottom right, and it's kind of hard to see it in the picture, but that is a, what is it, Marwari horse. They are specifically bred so that their ears touch. I'm like, that's impressed, that's cool. So his ears touch there. Now, looking at some of the extremes, and what was it? The biggest horse in history was a Shire horse named Samson. Hmm. He stood at a towering 21.25 hands, which translates into seven foot, two and a half inches tall. Okay, so I'm, I'm about 6'1", six, 6'2", six, so his, his, that's his withers. Okay, so his shoulders were at seven, over seven feet tall, his head, you know, just looking at the picture, you can tell his head's a whole lot higher than his shoulders. So he, I don't know, he, he's huge. Um, he also weighed 3,360 pounds. He was huge. Uh, with the impressive measurements, Samson was both the tallest and heaviest horse in history. Now on the other end of it, in 2001, a dwarf miniature horse named Thumbelina was born in Missouri. She matured to a whopping 17 inches. That's, that's her, the little bitty teen, tiny thing under the big horse. Um, and she weighed 57 pounds, receiving the title of world's smallest from the Guinness World Records. Okay, looking at dogs. Um, so top left hand, that is the Basenji. They don't bark. Somehow they bred the bark right out of the dog. I'm like, that's, that's cool. 
and then the very active mop is that, that's a common door. Um, then top right is a Brussels griffin, and then the bottom left, they bred the hair off the dog. It is a crested, a Chinese crested. And then the, the big guy in the middle is a cane corso. Okay, looking at some of the extremes there. Uh, Guinness World Records has declared two and a half year old Zeus, the tallest dog in the world at three foot, 5.18 inches. On his hind legs, he stands more than seven feet tall and weighs in about 200 pounds. On the other side of that, Millie, a one pound chihuahua, is the world's smallest dog as recognized by the Guinness World Records and you can hide her behind a dollar bill. <laughs> okay, so looking at this uh, genetic diversity that we have there, um, it does kind of raise the question, especially in our uh, world and society as far as microevolution, macroevolution, um, things like that that I was kind of hinted at as far as with the hummingbird that you, you can't just have one piece of it. Uh, I think it's called irreducible complexity, but you can't just have one piece of the hummingbird and it work. You got to have all the pieces or it doesn't work. Um, but looking at this as genetic diversity, it's called microevolution. We see it all the time around us. It is something that happens. It's, it's a, uh, the ability that God put into things to be able to adapt and work with their environment. But you don't see the macro evolution. You don't see them changing from one uh, type of animal into another. So going back to take a look at the horses, cattle, and dogs real quick. Um, now, I'm using, going off of more the kind of scientific as opposed to the uh, Christian perspective on things for just a moment. Excuse me. Uh, cattle were supposedly domesticated and selectively bred for up to 10,000 years. So that means that someone was actively looking at going, hey, we should breed that one to that one and we'll get this. Hey, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And they did that for 10,000 years. And at the end of it, you, you get fuzzy cattle and little tiny cattle and cattle that look like Oreo cookies. <laughs> but you still just get cattle. Um, horses. They, horses were supposedly domesticated and began to be selectively bred up to 15,000 years ago. Like we noted, you, you get some with a perm, you get some with ears that touch, some that are absolutely massive. Um, but even with people actively trying to select them for 15,000 years, you still just get horses. Same thing with the dogs, uh, but they were selectively bred for up from 20 to 40,000 years ago, you get no bark, you get them without hair, you get them looking like mops, but you still only get dogs. Last thing to note on that, um, this is your fruit fly. It's the Drosophila melangaster, uh, first studied by Thomas Hunt Morgan in 1913. It takes about 12 days, uh, I want to say from birth to uh, them being able to reproduce. So if you're looking at 12 day life or breeding cycle there, um, comparing that you know, from today back to then, you're looking at 3,315 different generations. And this is they, like in the lab, they were studying these and intentionally trying to play with genetics by selectively breeding them. Um, the most amazing result they came up with is they found the, the development of the Methuselah gene. It just means that your fruit fly lives longer. We all want our fruit flies to live longer. <laughs> but after 3,315 generations of them literally being playing with the genes in the lab, you still get fruit flies. They just live longer so they can annoy you more. But, Okay, um, looking at some of the wood, um, Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 90, it says, the trees far surpassed in size, beauty, and perfect proportion any now to be found. 
Their wood was of fine grain and hard substance, closely resembling stone and hardly less enduring. I would absolutely love to see wood from back then. That, that would be amazing. Um, but let's take a look at what we have today to try to at least get a vague idea of what it might have been back then. Okay, so a few pictures of the beautiful and symmetry, the, you know, the we, beauty that we see here. Now, just a note, the one that looks like someone's kid got a hold of it with a crayon box, um, that's actually actual color. That's, that's not digitally enhanced or anything like that. That's how it looks in nature. And I want to say that one is located, I, I apologize, I, don't, I didn't get the name on that one, um, but I think it's in Australia. But it, it's multicolored like that. It looks pretty neat. Now, uh, she also mentioned that as far as the grain, and some, there are some I know that work with wood and get to see some of the cool stuff, but I mean, this is some of the examples that we have today of some beautiful wood grains and everything. The bottom left hand, I think that's called curly maple, um, but it is, some of the wood grain is absolutely beautiful, and yet I'm pretty sure comparing what we see today to then would be very different. Um, okay, for 20 Sabbath shekels, what was the ark made out of? Yes, sir. I'm going to have to agree with you, sir. Yes, sir? Cypress. Cypress. Okay. And technically, you're both right. So congratulations. You get your 20 Sabbath shekels. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting. When you, when you actually look at different translations and everything, you, the, the different translations say that you have everything from gopher wood to gopher wood with a weird spelling, um, cypress, cedar, teak wood, squared timber, wooden or good timber. Um, turns out the challenge there is that the word used there is only used in the Bible one time. So they don't have any other context to try to figure out exactly what they were meaning there. So it could have potentially, it could have been, you know, like a species or it could have been maybe like saying, you know, like today, what's your house built out? Dimensional lumber. Oh, okay, that doesn't tell me what kind of wood. It tells you kind of what it's shaped like. But Okay, um, looking at some of the woods that we have today to compare, you know, because uh, Ellen White mentioned that it, you know, that it was a hard, very durable wood. Uh, the hardest wood that I could find, which gets interesting, when you start look, searching for what is the hardest wood, there's like apparently, I guess, different ways to test it, different opinions, all sorts of stuff. So... The common one I found was this one. It's African bull oak, or sorry, Australian, my bad. Um, the, it is the hardest, according to some, the hardest lumber in the world, and people call it ax breaker, and lumber specialists don't like working with it because it's so hard their tools become dull very quickly. Um, so that's what we're looking at now. It does, Ellen White mentions in Patriarchs and Prophets, the building of this immense structure, the ark, was a slow and laborious process. On account of the great size of the trees and the nature of the wood, much more labor was required then than now to prepare timber, even with the greater strength which men possessed. So last time we looked at some of the strength that were that the the antediluvians might have possessed there, um, as we recall, a 14 foot tall man being able to bench press 90 percent of his weight, he would have weighed in over 2,000 pounds. So he had been bench pressing somewhere around 1,800 pounds, if someone today was 14 foot tall. Um, <clears throat> we also looked at the idea that. With them being healthier and straight from the hand of God, pound per pound, they were probably stronger than we are today, um, potentially three times as strong. Therefore, Adam, being the average kind of guy, could have been able to bench press somewhere like 5,400 pounds. So just bench press a truck. Um, 
So looking at some of the other attributes that we see in our wood today to kind of figure out more about the arc potentially. Uh, the most flexible wood is, that's used for like bows, you're looking at like Osage orange, yew, oak, hickory, um, things like that. Now on a side note, the Mary Rose, I think it was uh, uh, like an English warship way back when, it sank and was very well preserved. And they, on that one, they found um, long bows with draw weights from 100 to 180 pounds. Uh, to give you a reference, the minimum allowed draw weight for bow hunting elk is 50 pounds. And most archers would struggle greatly just to draw back a 70 pound longbow, much less be accurate with it. And these guys were playing with up to 180 pounds. Um, they, they practice a lot and to the extent that people were able to look at their skeleton and go, oh, that's an archer. And I'm like, what? Because it, it changed their physique. But. Okay, looking at some of the biggest trees that we have, you know, different varieties and sizes there. Um, the largest cedar tree is called the big cedar tree. Huh? <laughs> <clears throat> it is believed to be a thousand years old, 175 feet tall, and nearly 20 feet in diameter. Um, you also have the largest cypress tree, it's called the Senator, and it's a bald cypress that stood 125 feet tall with a base diameter of just over 12, uh, 11 feet, and is believed to be 3,500 3, years old. Now. Just a note on how you gauge the age of a tree. Um, most of the time they're going to do a core sample and just basically drill a hole in the tree and take out a sample of it and then you have some lucky individual sit there and count rings. So that should be pretty accurate. The tallest tree in the world is called Hyperion and it is a 380 foot redwood that is believed to be 600 to 800 years old. The oldest living tree, amazingly, I don't know how they came up with the name, they called it Methuselah. Um, it is 4,789 years old and it is a bristlecone pine that is only 50 feet tall. Um, so we have that. Now, something that I found interesting um, when reading, you know, Ellen White was talking about as far as the, the flood and everything, she mentioned there that angels that excel in strength were commissioned to preserve the ark um, in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 100. What is an angel that excel in strength? I mean, aren't they all like amazing and powerful and and how do you, you have the strong ones is that the ones that like bench press worlds or i mean i can't even wrap my head around what a one that excels in strength would be um she also mentions that satan himself who was compelled to remain in the midst of the warring elements feared for his own existence that kind of brings me up probably a not so happy um, pleasure there to know that. But <clears throat> all of this we're looking at shows God's love. Um, Enoch, as we discussed last time, Enoch received the prophecy of the flood possibly 700 years prior because God was trying to warn the people. Um, God's love in the selection of eight righteous people to save, you know, he kind of had to work with the best that he had there. Um, God lovingly giving Noah detailed instructions about how to build the ark. He could have just told him, hey, you need to build this, good luck. Um, 120 years of active warning before the flood. Um, God's loving demonstration of the animals entering the ark for an entire week in an effort to persuade others to save themselves. Um, God's love in assigning a buff angel to protect and safeguard the ark during the storm, and then God's loving kindness of giving the rainbow so that we don't worry about another worldwide flood there. <clears throat> 
found a, a neat little quote there. It says, it's by Ellen White. It says, it's a law both of the intellectual and spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Great Controversy, page 555. And one other quote, it is a law of the human mind that by beholding we become changed. Man will rise no higher than his conceptions of truth, purity, and holiness. If the mind is never exalted above the level of humanity, if it is not lifted, if, sorry, if it is not uplifted by faith to contemplate infinite wisdom and love, then man will, con will be constantly sinking lower and lower. Um, that's kind of where I'm going with some of the stuff that, I've, that we've been talking about, um, is just trying to bring up neat things, interesting things that hopefully um, excite your curiosity about what else is in the Bible, what other things can we find there. I hope that the concepts presented about the flood excite your curiosity and interest to the extent that it will motivate us all to search God's word for more jewels to be mined. And by thus searching for more truths, we spend more time with and learning more of our amazing and loving creator and redeemer.